Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very tragic and heartbreaking, but thankfully it does have a very good ending. This case in general will make you very upset, but I still think that it will be nice to have a good ending to a case like this one. But before we get into it, I want to say a huge thank you to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, then you know that I absolutely love Harry's razors for their premium quality and their low prices. Harry's blade are made in their own factory in Germany. They balance the quality with affordability because they offer everything that you need at a factory direct price, nothing more and nothing less. They always offer a fair price to everybody, no pink tax or other upcharges like other brands while not skimping out on quality. Trust me, Harry's razors deliver. I only use Harry's razors now because they're the only razors that give me that smooth, silky skin from a nice close shave without facing the consequences of razor burn and bumps like I do with other brands. Before, when I used to shave, I would have to do it like a day or two before swimming or whatever I was shaving for because I always had red inflamed skin for the first day or so and it was always super uncomfortable, super itchy, and it just did not look good. But I don't deal with that anymore thanks to Harry's. I also love their foaming shave gel. It's made with loving ingredients like citric acid and hyaluronic acid for that close, comfortable shave with their razors. The great thing about Harry's is that they give you everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave in a starter kit at an amazing price. If you use my link down below, you can get your Harry's trial set for only $5.00. That is a $13 value, so again, make sure you use my link down below to get yours for only $5. Thank you again so much to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the amazing survival story of Abby Hernandez. Abby Hernandez was born on October 12, 1998 in Manchester, New Hampshire. She was described by her family as a happy, kind, joyous, cheerful girl from the time that she was a child throughout her whole life. She was a sweet girl who loved animals and classic rock. She and her mother, Xenia, were both very athletic and they loved hiking together and she participated in various sports at school. She was 14 years old at the time that this occurred and she had just started her freshman year of high school at Kennett High School in North Conway, New Hampshire. In high school, she was beginning to study German and robotics, and she loved it. Abby walked to and from school every day. This was something that she enjoyed, and the day of October 9th, 2013 was no different. She walked to school and went about her day as normal. By 2.30 p.m. that same day, the school librarian watched as she left school to walk back home as normal. Now, Abby and her mother, Zanya, they were always very close. They would always be in close contact with one another, and if Abby was going to be home late or go to a friend's house or something like that, she would always let her mother know. So, when Xenia returned home from her job as a nurse that day and Abby wasn't home on the evening of October 9th after coming home from school, Xenia knew that something had to be wrong. She texted her daughter to see where she was, but she got no answer. Once again, this was very odd and out of character for Abby, so Xenia immediately got worried. But at first, she tried not to panic too much. She thought that maybe she forgot her phone or she lost track of time when she was talking to friends after class or something like that. So, Xenia got in her car and drove to the school to see if Abby was there. She ended up talking to the school librarian who reported seeing her leave the school at 2.30, like I mentioned. So, at that point, Xenia knew that Abby had at least left the school. So, now a new worry started to pop into her head. She worried that maybe Abby was hurt. What if she had an injury? What if she broke her leg? And God forbid, what if she got hit by a car? So the next thing that Xenia thought to do was to call the local hospital, but they also hadn't seen her. At that point, Xenia started to get frantic. After several hours of panicking and searching for her daughter, by 7 p.m. that same day, Xenia called the police to report Abby as a missing person. At first, of course, police wondered if she ran away, but Xenia knew that this was not the case. Again, that would have been totally out of character for Abby. There wasn't any issues at home, no changes in Abby's behaviors. 
Plus, this was only three days away from Abby's 15th birthday and they were planning a big birthday party with a bunch of friends, so Xenia knew that Abby wouldn't have just simply ran away right before her birthday. So as police started with their investigation, they spoke with more witnesses who saw her leaving school that day. Again, Abby was last seen leaving the school. She walked through the field hockey field before turning onto a power line trail near the school. Between 2.30 and 2.35 p.m., she was seen walking along that power line trail, traveling away from the school. As she was walking, she was texting back and forth with her boyfriend, another teenager named Jimmy, with her last text to him being a heart to Jimmy. That was sent at 2.53 p.m. Using this, police were able to track where her cell phone last pinged. They found that at 3.07 p.m., her cell signal disappeared about a mile away from her house. After that, her phone stopped picking up any signal whatsoever. At this point, people around the community started to wonder if there was something going on in her personal life that would make her want to run away. Maybe she was dealing with mental health issues that nobody else knew about. Her friends all said, though, that she was her fun, silly self, that she was goofing off the very day that she went missing. None of her friends or anybody close to her got the impression that anything was off. It was really just people around the neighborhood who were wondering if maybe she did run away. Police also looked into the communication between Abby and her boyfriend around the time that she went missing, as well as throughout their relationship, to see if there was anything going on there. Was there jealousy in the relationship? Was there some jealousy issues that made them think that her boyfriend would want to hurt her? Over the months that followed, police looked into everybody in Abby's inner circle. Outside of her boyfriend, they looked at her family members, her friends, her classmates, literally anybody in her life that she had even been acquainted with. And they found out that nothing pointed towards anybody in her inner circle being involved whatsoever. They checked on the locations of everybody that she knew at the time that she disappeared. They followed up on the various alibis that they were getting, and at this point, it really seemed that she just disappeared without any trace, and nobody that she was close with had anything to do with it. Police also found the surveillance video from the school that did show her leaving, and based on what she was carrying with her, it didn't look like she had enough belongings with her to show that she wanted to run away or be away for an extended period of time. They also checked her bank account and there was no activity there either, so nothing was pointing towards her wanting to run away or being away for a long time. Zenya spent the following months tirelessly searching for her daughter. She went outside and retraced every step that she thought Abby could have taken. She searched on foot. She drove around looking for clues. She did everything in her power to find her missing daughter. She was desperate. Then, by November 6, 2013, Xenia found a sign of hope. On this day, she opened her mailbox and she found a letter from Abby. The letter was postmarked on October 23rd, almost two weeks after her disappearance. When opening the letter, Xenia said that she could tell that it was Abby's handwriting and the investigators did determine that it was her who wrote it as well, based on the tone and the handwriting. They also found her DNA on that letter as well. Xenia said, though, that even though she could tell she wrote it, it felt off. She was worried if maybe she was forced or coerced into writing it. She didn't feel like Abby was just out there writing on her own free will, hiding out somewhere, and writing letters to her family. The letter reads as follows. Dear Mom, I miss you and I love you so much more than you could imagine. I'm sorry I did this. I've seen the newspapers and TV news and to answer your questions, yes, I'm alive. I'm safe and I'm healthy. And she wrote heart throughout this entire letter. I really miss you, Mom, but I won't tell you where I am. I love you so much. Please stay strong for me. I'm staying strong for you. I've come to realize that along with love and courage, hope can speak louder than fear. Please don't lose hope. Hang in there for me, Mom. I had a dream where I came home and gave you the biggest hug ever. I don't know if it matters, but I like to think that it does. Please don't forget that I love you. Please give Sarah a hug for me and tell her that I love her and miss her very much. I pray that her dreams will come true. Love, Abby. At that point, police weren't able to tell where the letter was postmarked from. 
They also didn't know why it apparently took two weeks from the time that she wrote it to when it ended up in the mailbox. They couldn't tell whether she wrote the letter behind the captor's back or if he had let her and he sent it out himself. So, police didn't release this letter for at least a month. They wanted to keep it a secret because if she did write this letter without her captor's knowledge, they feared that her kidnapper might retaliate and hurt her. But after a month passed and police got no new leads, police released the letter and it did come with some consequences that the police and family did not foresee. A lot of people in the community interpreted the letter as Abby confessing that she actually just ran away and was hiding out. Many people started accusing the family of faking a kidnapping and all being involved in this whole elaborate scheme. They demanded that the family pay back what police spent on searching for Abby. People in the community were furious at the family. But again, those close to Abby knew that she did not run away. And again, Abby's mother knew that the way she wrote this letter just did not sound like Abby and it didn't seem like she was writing it on her own free will. They knew that she was taken from them and thankfully at this point, police agreed. Based on the letter, police were not swayed and they continued their investigation into her disappearance as a kidnapping. Either way, after receiving the letter, Xenia went to the media to plead for her daughter's safe return and Xenia wrote Abby back in a letter. She begged her to come home. She said just how much she misses her and loves her and just wants her to be back for Christmas. In a letter dated November 22nd, she wrote, Dear Abby, I believe you are out there watching and listening to me right now. I miss you and love you so much more than you can imagine. I feel your absence every day. You belong at home with me. Abby, you are a strong woman and I'm staying strong for you. You are courageous, you are smart, and you are beautiful. Abby, you matter to me. I believe you are alive and I know that hope speaks louder than fear and it is my hope that you can reach out to me. I feel your absence every day and I want you home with me. I will do anything and everything in my power to help you make your dreams come true. Abby, I keep having a dream where you come home and I give you the biggest hug ever. I know in my heart this dream means something and that it matters. I pray to God that it will come true. Love, mom. In the months that followed this, police spent hours and hours continuing to search for Abby. They conducted line searches on foot in the woods around the Canmore Ski Resort and a thousand square miles of wilderness in the surrounding areas. They searched the mountainous terrain. They used helicopters to search from above. They wasted no time or resources in their searches, but they just kept coming up empty. But then, in a very drastic turn of events, after tirelessly searching and coming up with nothing, nine months after Abby's disappearance, on July 20th, 2014, she walked into her home. Abby would later describe that in this moment, she walked in and said, Mom, and her mom turned around and said, Abby, and saw her daughter standing at the door. Of course, she immediately ran over to her and gave her the biggest hug that she possibly could. Xenia could tell right away that Abby had been through something horrible. She was pale and she had lost a ton of weight. She could just see that the immeasurable amounts of stress had changed Abby's appearance. After Abby's disappearance, the family had actually set up a security video outside of the house and this camera actually picked up the video of Abby returning back home and walking inside. Of course, after returning home, there was still this entire process of contacting the authorities and telling them what happened, which is just another thing that Abby had to go through that is absolutely traumatizing, having to relive what she went through and telling the police everything that happened. After the days of her return, she met with the police a few different times and she gave the story of what happened to her. She said that she was kidnapped, held in a shed, where she was tortured and abused for nine months straight. On the afternoon of October 9th, 2013, Abby was walking home from school, as I mentioned earlier. On this day, however, she happened to be wearing some new boots that she was still breaking in without socks, so they were hurting her feet. As she was walking, a man pulled up next to her in a pickup truck and asked her if she wanted a ride home. At that point, her feet were aching, they were blistering, and she just wanted some rest. She knew that she was only about a mile away from her home, so she didn't think that it would be a big deal to catch a short ride with someone. 
So she agreed and she got into the car with this man. After they started driving, he asked her if he could make a stop at Home Depot before he dropped her off. And she said that it was fine that she could actually just walk home from the Home Depot. But almost immediately after this question was asked, almost immediately after she got into the car, the man pulled out a gun and pointed it at her. He threatened to slit her throat open. He threatened to slit her throat open and blow her effing brains out. He said, if you scream or try to escape or make any efforts to escape, there will be consequences. Immediately though, Abby used her intuition to try to get along with the kidnapper in hopes that she wouldn't be harmed. She promised that she would behave, but she also said that if he released her, she wouldn't tell anybody and he wouldn't get in trouble. But as she rode in the car, the man placed her in handcuffs and put a shirt over her head. Then he broke her phone so that they wouldn't be tracked. As they drove, she would try peeking through the car window to figure out where they were, but the man noticed and shocked her with a stun gun. Throughout the car ride, he asked her multiple times if the taser hurt and continued to tase her over and over and over again. After riding about an hour, traveling 30 miles in the car, the man finally stopped. They arrived at a home in Gorham where he placed her in a tiny, cramped, windowless shipping container on his property. The first day that she was there, the man covered her eyes with tape, a shirt, and then put a motorcycle helmet over her head. He then zip-tied her hands and feet, and then he raped her. Things like that would happen all throughout the time that she was held captive there. Throughout that time, Abby suffered from almost constant abuse. She was raped, abused, and bound. The zip ties were on her so tight that she now has scars on her wrists and ankles from them, and while they were on, she lost feelings in her fingers and hands. At one point, the man also bought a shock collar. He told her that he wanted to try something new to keep her captive without, like, hurting her as much. So he put the shock collar on her and said, okay, try to scream. So she started to slowly raise her voice and whenever she did that, it shocked her. And after it shocked her, he said, okay, now you know what it feels like, telling her basically not to scream. He refused to tell her his name, telling her to call him master. While she was in that shipping container, she always had a security camera watching her and throughout those nine months, she didn't get any fresh air. She got no sunlight. She was stuck inside with her captor who put a chain around her neck to keep her from moving around or fighting too much when he raped or abused her. He also forced her to wear a diaper. The other thing that he did was he placed a tube in her mouth with what they would later describe as like a toggle-like device that he weaved through the restraints and into her hands. If she needed or wanted water, she would hit the toggle and the water would just drip into her mouth. He repeatedly threatened her and at the points where the shipping container door would be open, he said that if that door was open for too long, it would catch fire and she would burn to death. He threatened to kill her family, her pets, should she ever escape. Also, as she was stuck in there, of course, her captor watched as the news covered her disappearance and he let Abby watch it. Abby just had to sit there and watch as her mother begged and pleaded with her to come home. She probably saw news reports of people saying that Abby just ran away. They probably saw horrible things that they were saying about her and her family just setting up this elaborate kidnapping scheme in the media. I'm sure for her kidnapper, that was the best thing ever. I'm sure he let her know very well that nobody believed that he took her and that everybody believed that she ran away. So there was probably a good chunk of time that she thought that nobody except her mother was looking for her. But like I just said a minute ago, Abby sort of just knew that she had to gain the trust of her captor in order to stay alive. She said that throughout her captivity, she prayed every day. She never lost hope that she was going to survive because her only goal in mind was to survive. She did so by learning about her captor and gaining his trust. He tried to do the same with her though. He wanted her to trust him and he wanted to create a bond with her. So because of this, he allowed her to read books. One of the books was a cookbook that he gave her and allowed her to read. 
In that cookbook, she actually learned his name, Nate Kibbe. That was because the name had been written in the cookbook and he didn't realize that it was written in there because again, he didn't tell her his name. He didn't want her to know his name but it was written in there and he didn't realize it. So the entire time she just went along with whatever he wanted and pretended to feel connected with him. While in captivity, he actually allowed her to write that one letter to her mom, but the one that she sent was actually the second draft that she had written. When writing the first letter, he instructed Abby to make it sound like she had run away. So she did. In the first letter though, she actually used her fingernail to make an imprint on the paper which said help. I think this was a smart move, but unfortunately, Nate did notice it and he viciously attacked her for trying to make this attempt. So he made her write it again and this time she didn't give any hint to what she was going through. So he allowed her to send this letter to her mother. It even got to the point that Nate had involved himself with this money counterfeiting operation. He wanted Abby's help with it, so she agreed to take part in it, again, to just build this trust with him, make him believe that she was there and she wanted to be there. The two made counterfeit money together, and again, Nate started to feel like Abby was sort of his partner. However, at one point, Nate had hired a sex worker, and he tried paying her with this counterfeit money. But after that encounter with the sex worker, he received a phone call from her. She told him that she had just been apprehended by the police after using the money that he gave her at a local Walmart. She found out that the money that he gave her was counterfeit. She told Nate that she told the police that he was the one who gave her that money. So she said to be careful with what you are making in that basement because police are going to be searching his home soon. What she didn't know was that he was actually holding a young teenager captive. In reality, she just thought that he was making fake money and she was pissed about it. But this spooked Nate enough that he was really worried that the police were going to be showing up soon. So on the evening of July 20th, 2014, he told Abby, police will be here. I have to get rid of everything, including you. At that point, Nate thought that he terrorized Abby enough that she wouldn't tell the police. He made her promise that she wouldn't tell anybody and because of those nine months that she spent gaining his trust, she promised not to tell anybody and he believed her. Thank goodness he thought that because that evening he took Abby to his car and drove her to an old abandoned road in North Conway. This was just down the street from where she was kidnapped nine months earlier. As Abby got out of the car, she was just relieved to finally smell the scent of fresh air she was happy to be outside. She was happy to not be chained up and confined anymore. She walked the remaining mile back to her mother's house and walked in through the front door. So now going back to the weeks following Abby's reappearance. Abby was actually really scared to give the police the identity of her captor at first. She initially told the police that the man who took her was a heavyset man with a darker complexion and a Massachusetts accent. But Xenia would later tell the police that Abby wasn't initially truthful. Abby confided in her mother that she knew the name of the man who took her. And she knew that law enforcement would be able to identify him and his location if she gave his name up but she was scared. So about a week after her reappearance, she finally came clean to the police. She told them that the man who kidnapped her was Nate Kibbs. She described what his residence looked like as well as what the inside of the shed looked like. She was then shown a photo lineup of eight men, including Nate Kibbs, and she immediately identified the man who took her. She said that she was 98% certain that this was the man who took her. So because of her identifying him, police were able to track him down and he was arrested. In total, he actually faced 205 different charges, including kidnapping, sexual assault, robbery, criminal threatening, illegal use of a gun, and illegal use of an electronic restraint device. Initially, his bail was set to $1 million. After that, he waited in jail for two years while working with prosecutors to come up with a deal. Ultimately, he worked with prosecutors to plead guilty to seven felony charges, including aggravated sexual assault, kidnapping, witness tampering, and criminal threatening. At his sentencing hearing, Abby mustered up the strength to face Nate and deliver a victim impact statement. She thanked him for letting her go, 
but she let him know just how much his actions have affected her life. I was told that I would have to give a victim impact statement and that I would have my time in court to talk. Um, it seems like forever, two years have gone by, both, both fast and slow in different senses. But I often think about Kibi and what he did affects my life on a day-to-day -day basis. I am, my name does not mean the same thing anymore that it did before October 9th. I'm attending school and I'm afraid to let anybody know what my last name is. Nobody knows what my last name is. Um, I fall asleep thinking about you. And some people might call you a monster, but I've always looked at you as human. And I want you to know that even though life became a lot harder after that, that I still forgive you. That I wish things didn't have to work in the way that they do. But I need to be safe, and so does my family. And I want you to know that I did not do this to you. I did not put you in prison. You put yourself in prison. So I can't carry that blame on my shoulders when it's simply not true that I put you in prison. When you decided to point that gun at me, that was not my choice. It was not my choice to go to your house. It was not my choice for you to rape me. It was not my choice for you to threaten me. You did all that yourself. I don't want to talk down on you, and I hope that you don't think that I am. I'm just telling you the truth. Because sometimes I feel like I wear this whole thing like a millstone around my ankle. Sometimes I still feel like I'm chained and sometimes I don't feel like I'm completely free. There are certain aspects of my freedom that I can never get back. But in the same aspect, I want you to know that I appreciate my freedom because of you and that I enjoy and appreciate life because of you, and that I never look at sunshine in the same way, and that I never think about fresh air in the same way. So, and I also just want to thank you for giving me my freedom back. At the sentencing hearing, he was given a sentence of 45 to 60 years in prison. Hopefully, he will never get out. Hopefully, he will never see the light of day again. Hopefully, he dies behind bars and suffers even more than what he forced Abby to suffer for those nine grueling months. As of 2022, Abby has moved on with her life. She works as a hairdresser and she has a young son. There was also a Lifetime movie made about her case where Abby actually worked with the film crew to create the movie. She said that it was really difficult to relive the worst time in her life but it was healing to get her story out there and to tell the world what a monster her kidnapper was. So this is all of the information for this case that I have for you all today. Obviously, what this young girl had to go through is just unimaginable. The trauma that she must have had to overcome is just incredible, but the amount of strength that she showed during and after this whole ordeal is truly amazing. The fact that at 14 years old, her intuition told her exactly what to do and it worked is just incredible to me. I'm sure that this is going to take a lifetime to heal. I'm sure that she's still healing every single day of her life. I'm sure that not a day goes by that she doesn't still feel the trauma, but in the end, I'm so happy she survived. I'm so glad that she's here to tell her story. And I'm so happy that this man got the jail time that he deserves. It is nice to cover cases like this one once in a while where we know the outcome and the victim is still alive and is still able to tell their story. So that is why I chose to cover this case when I stumbled upon it. But either way, I want to know what you guys think about this case. Do you think that he got enough jail time? 
What do you think of all of the things that she went through? And what do you honestly think of the community thinking that she ran away after writing that letter? Because I can kind of see where they're coming from. But that part of this case also kind of just like irked me a little bit, knowing that she was in captivity, seeing all these people like not believing her. That's just a part of this case that really bothered me. But what do you guys think about all of that? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.